We are at the DEF CON 30 CTF run by Nautilus, and the teams have been doing crazy things with a few issues along the way, but it is nuts this year because you have the teams and then you have this whole live aspect where teams come on over here. Can you just tell me high level, how did you design this CTF? Like, what are the teams actually playing? Well, let's, uh, let, let's step back a second and say this is your first year doing the DEF CON CTF. Although many people on Nautia, Nautilus have designed CTFs before, or in this particular CTF. What is Nautilus doing this year for the CTF? That's either different, or what are your takes on it this year? So, uh, what we're doing here is a relatively um, traditional CTF. Uh, the CTF has evolved over the years. Um, the general structure has stayed the same. So there's N teams. This year there's 16 teams. Uh, each team gets access to their own server. Okay. Um, all the servers are identical. Those servers are running executables on them uh, that provide services. Those services are vulnerable. Um, there's yeah. stuff that we have created. No one's on, no, none of the teams have seen these things before. Um, and uh, they reverse engineer those services, uh, find vulnerabilities, write exploits, and throw the exploits at other teams to get uh, text tokens off of the game boxes, which are called flags, and then they submit them to our scoreboard. Sure, so this is, um, and, and we can get a little more technical or use some, some internal jargon. This is a typical attack and defense CTF. So the core of the CTF is a typical attack and defense. So they have uh, servers that they're defending against other teams and servers that they're attacking that the other teams have, right? Um, is, so this is where I like to get into it, which is the actual challenges, if you will, or the actual exploitables on the machines are new every year. And everyone has a different take on what should or should not go in. Um, and what, I, you've already burned a bunch of challenges. Are there things that you're particularly proud of this year that you may have designed and, and got put on? So we had one challenge this year called Web4 Factory from Itzen, one of our uh, one of the Nautilus members who's new to organizing CTFs, or at least new to organizing DEF CON CTF. And I think it was deeply, deeply hilarious. Uh, as the Web4 Factory implies, it's a Java applet, or a Java program, not a Java applet. Uh, it's a Java server that has, you know, deeply nested classes, like teams entered the, the uh, applet, or the Java... I'm too old, I'm thinking Java applets all the time. But they went to like institute.nautilus.web4factory.web4factory.factory all the way oh down gosh. this you know, horrible Java chain of classes. Uh, that was one that we ran through yesterday. Uh, and I thought it was funny enough that I made a custom sticker for it in kind of secret without telling anybody about it. That's fantastic. I heard you like classes with your classes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So we put a class factory in your class factory so you can factory classes while you factory classes. Oh, my God. You've been practicing that a little bit too much, <laughs> haven't you? <laughs> so we also heard that you guys, you know, well, I mean, we've been having some power issues and, and things that were going on and off throughout the conference. Have you guys got hit by any of the infrastructure issues? Uh, honestly, uh, DEF CON has provided like awesome power, awesome network. Uh, unfortunately, most of the hardware issues that we've had were our own. Uh, we didn't have some of the servers kind of correctly configured uh, before we brought them here. Um, and so we did run into an issue yesterday where we had to retire a challenge early in order to basically keep the load on the boxes down. Uh, and this led to us spending all night actually reconfiguring all of the hardware so we could run today's challenges more smoothly, which did fortunately work. So um, would you say this year is going smoother or less smooth than a typical CTF? Because that sounds, I, I've run my own, and that sounds like uh, something that pops up in most cases. Yeah. So uh, both Vito and myself have actually run the DEF CON CTF before. Vito's pretty old hat at it. Uh, I ran uh, this last in 2017 with uh, the legitimate business, business syndicate. Um, and relative to the year that I was playing, or uh, that I was um, hosting, uh, this has gone a little bit more rough. It's our first year, uh, whereas I was helping the legitimate business syndicate in their last year. So they had had, at, the, at that point, four previous years to kind of perfect everything. So the first year is usually kind of rough. You're building everything from scratch. You're, you're kind of getting all your tech together. Uh, this is the first time you've really had to have teams interact with it. Um, but I, I don't know if your experience has been... Uh, my experiences were broadly similar to that. We always, it felt like as legit BS, uh, legitimate business syndicate, we always had to do some kind of cleanup after the first day. Something would unexpectedly break or, you know, scoring would, you know, break, uh, checking for, you know, service uptime would break at some point. 
And there's always a little bit of fix-ups. Uh, I think 2016 was a particularly rough year for us because we went in, that was the Cyber Grand Challenge year, the, where uh, we supported autonomous, the winner from the DARPA competition playing our game as an autonomous computer. And that was a different enough game from our previous years that we had a ton of problems. Uh, that was, I think, the year we didn't start our finals on time. And there were just lots and lots of little issues that year. I mean, you, you keep talking about the problems, which is like, it, they are interesting. The thing which is fascinating to me is that you have legitimately the best hackers in the world in this room spend their entire year training kind of for this event. They pre-qualify, they get in here, and you have to design an event in such a weird way because you're not designing secure software. That's what's so weird about this. You're designing, in, you're designing a maze, an insecure software enough where players can solve it in a finite amount of time. I am curious though, when you design a, a, a solution, I think of um, the movie Inception, where he says, give me a maze that you have to solve and it takes me exactly one minute to solve. How has it been when you design challenges? Because I know you have this whole live aspect which throws a loop. You're designing a challenge where you go, this has to be solved, I expect this to be solved in one hour. How do you go about gauging how difficult some of these challenges are when you're dealing with legitimately the best hackers, arguably in the world for binary, binary exploitation, things like that? So for us, I feel like there's a large aspect of that for people on our team is experience. And there's a lot of CTF playing experience on our team. So for some of the challenges, if somebody's not sure about how difficult it's going to be, we pass it to you know, a legitimately great CTF player that's playing with us. Uh, Shellfish, for the last few years, their powerhouse has been uh, Fish, who has uh, thankfully joined Nautilus Institute. Uh, and Fish is one of the best reversers in the world. Fish is working hard every day you know, in his normal job on better you know, software for analyzing software. Mm -hmm. So you know, he's an incredible play tester, and he's not the only incredible play tester on our team. How do, you, how do you balance? Like, there's there's this whole key. Because I, I, I love playing CTS, play the NSEC one. There's so many great ones out there. And when I've played them, there's this weird balance that happens between, like, security through obscurity, which leads to mostly frustration on the team. Because it leads you down these rabbit holes, and the, 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 the challenge starts becoming, how do I overcome all these red herrings to find you know, the, we, the toad well, of truth? So full disclosure, we used to help run DEF CON Darknet, which is a more introductory CTF. It gets people into the con, gets them around the con, gets them towards these more advanced things. And the, the question for us is always those, that red herring question. Do you worry so much at this level about the red herring problem where someone picks up on the wrong thing, or is that their fault? So um, in terms of our game, like so the, the larger attack defense CTF, we don't really worry about that at all. The best teams are not going to get tripped up by those kind of things. They're not going to get lost down some sort of unexploitable rabbit hole. They, they've got enough experience to kind of be able to feel these things out quickly and hone in on the right stuff. For the live CTF event, that is a consideration because you want the challenge to be solvable within an hour. And if both competitors are stuck on some you know, rabbit chase down something that's not exploitable, that's not a good challenge design for that format. No, I was just trying to move mic a little oh. closer. Oh, so, uh, yeah, well, well, we had a, a short discussion with Cyphertex about the live CTF, and of course he's actually helping, he's one of the commentators actually running. How has that been going? I heard that the, one of these last rounds went a really long time, in part because you throw a problem at them, and then it takes them an hour, and then their brain gets fried, and then you go to your backup challenge, which is supposed to be really, really easy, but by that point, they're so frustrated that they can't even do that one, which, you know, that, that, this is a thing that happens. It happens to seasoned professionals. Has that been happening a lot, or has that just been popping up here and there? So specifically in the context of, of live CTF, uh, I haven't seen it happen too much. I believe that's actually the only challenge of the day that went to like a sudden death. Like they couldn't solve the original challenge in 45 minutes, so they were provided an easier one and then had to do that one. Um, I was worried actually, so I had one of the challenges in live CTF this year. I was worried that my challenge, we were going to have to switch to a, uh, uh, um, like a backup challenge to make sure the round uh, went through. And I gotta be honest, the, uh, the person who solved it, I wasn't really following what his exploit was um, when he was doing it. He was so fast on the keyboard. Like it was like watching a StarCraft player or something, <laughs> but with like code. Um, and uh, I thought that we were going to have to, you know, give out one of these, uh, you know, easier challenges kind of thing. And then he just, he got it. It was great. 
So, uh, so this brings up the question, which is what have been the pinnacle moments that have happened so far in the CTF? My favorite so far has have been especially live CTF related, but every time there's applause on the room or somebody jumping up or somebody cheering, that is something I always really enjoy to see in a CTF. Uh, I, don't, I haven't been super paying attention to see if that's been happening with First Blood on any of the regular challenges and the regular part of the CTF, but it's always cool to see when somebody gets that breakthrough and they get excited about it. I love it. So has that been happening primarily with the attack and defense or on the live CTF? So in our game, um, because it's attack and defend and you have to like have a sustained attack, it's not like one little rush of like, yes, I scored a point. You're scoring points continuously. <laughs> Um, there's not usually as much animation from teams. Um, it's kind of like, yes, okay, we scored on that one, now let's get another vulnerability kind of things. Um, and our challenges for the main game are uh, designed to have more than one vulnerability inside of them. So the reason we do that is because we want teams to you know, patch one vulnerab vulnerability but still be vulnerable in another way. And that you know, keeps them like, looking at this stuff for hours and hours and hours trying to figure out how do we you know, figure this out. One of my uh, favorite things from our game uh, is two of our top teams earlier today uh, were in kind of this like interesting, uh, both teams were, were leading, they both had exploits on a service, they both had patched that service, but they were going back and forth, uh, basically dosing each other's like service, like finding ways to, to make it do things that weren't intended, and then... Uh, we have like an SLA checker that's like, hey, is your service up and responding to things correctly? They were finding ways to basically like get it to be in weird states. Uh, it was interesting seeing them go back and forth, kind of like making each other lose points and getting points off of other teams. And like for a, a sustained period of time, it was definitely these two teams kind of going at it. And that's, that's really cool to see in our game. So I, I remember during the Cyber Grand Challenge uh, year uh, that th it was announced at the end that uh, a number of the competitors had found a bunch of what would amount to zero days or just unintended bugs in the challenges that were discovered. Has that happened at this CTF yet where there was some kind of exploit that was just not expected? Uh, yes, that, that has happened. Uh, there was a challenge we released earlier today. Uh, I think it was called Mambo. Uh, and there was a, a heat bug that we didn't intend to be in the challenge, and a, a team found it and exploited it. It was great. That's, that's exactly what we want. You, do you ever see escalation with the teams? And what I mean by that is you have, like, I imagine like myself, in, in my day job even, where I'm bashing my face across something over and over and over, and I'm getting nowhere, and then you start going, all right, Jello against the wall, and I try this, and I try this, and then they escalate almost to the point where uh, the, it, the rules get a little wishy-washy in the fact where like, they're doing stuff they're not really supposed to. Is, has any of that happened? Uh, yeah, so we have had some team... It's hard running a hacking competition, yeah. right? Because there's, it's really hard to enforce rules when the whole point of hacking is that you're getting around like rules, basically, in, yeah. in a program. Um, we have had a couple of teams uh, that have... So I mentioned the, the dosing earlier. If if you're if you're specifically targeting like a patch that another team has made, that's kind of cool. But if you're running like a fork bomb on a bunch of servers that's going to like take down the whole game, that's not so cool. Um, so we we kind of have some loose you know spirit of the game kind of rules that are kind of like, hey, make sure people can still play. Um, you know, make sure that we're not like attacking our infrastructure. We put a lot of of time and effort and work into this. It, it's, really frustrating to have our stuff come crashing down just because, you know, somebody decided to, you know, run a fork bomb or something. It's um, fascinating me, as you said, like, with hacking challenges, you're, you're designing them to be broken, and then you have kind of the semblance of rules, because I remember when you're like, oh, goodness, this is a while back where the scoreboard gets hacked into and things like that. With this challenge, how, how, are, the challenge, how are the teams really dealing with um, we'll see the size limitation. So like with this, you have open. Are you finding a mass difference in the sizes of teams? We aren't actually completely sure about how big some of these teams are. Uh, one of the things I was most worried about, and I promise this is an actual answer to your question, uh, kind of in a roundabout way, I was really, really worried that the you know 16 tables in this room were going to have one person holding a VPN open and responding to like events in the room for everybody else elsewhere. Instead, what we've seen is you know most of the seats at these tables are full, like all eight of them. Uh, every time I look around, it's it's a busy room, and I really, really love to see that. We don't necessarily know how many players are you know up in hotel rooms or back at home, 
but I can't imagine that it would be wildly out of place to assume anywhere between, you know, eight people or, you know, 40 maybe. One of the problems with bigger teams is, you know, kind of endemic to all software engineering or all engineering in general, where the bigger your team, the more communication that has to get done back and forth between groups. And since we haven't had, you know, more than about half a dozen challenges open at any time, there's dubious value to having, you know, 80 people working on, you know, one thing. That, that brings up a question though. Of the teams that are doing well, what do you think they're doing that the other teams aren't doing? Are they just getting luckier with the challenges? And I mean, they're not luck, but you get the idea where you're finding those problems a little quicker, or do you think it's a communication thing? What do you think separating the teams? Something that I find is really important when you're playing a CTF is to get into this mindset where you're failing very quickly. So you try as many things as possible uh, in as short a period of time. And what I have found as a player and also watching as an organizer watching all of these players is that the best uh, teams, the best players tend to be people who are able to very quickly iterate through a number of you know, thoughts or, or, or uh, you know, like different scripts or things to, to try things out to see what they think is going to work. Um, and so I think that a lot of the teams who are doing, doing better are just able to, to make these iterations to, to adapt much more fast than the other teams. Okay. As an ancillary of that, somebody you know, in this conversation maybe was watching me write a SQL query to analyze some scoring event earlier today. And I definitely was in the zone there for you know, a minute or two, like you know, type a clause, hit enter, see if it works, type another clause, hit enter. And it felt really, really good to just blast it out like that step by step, getting to a destination. So I want to get into a little bit of, uh, it, it is a game, right? And, and I always like the game design aspect of it. And, and this is really hard because I'm, I'm not a PVP gamer. I, that's why I typically don't uh, attend attack and defense CTFs. <laughs> he is a PVP gamer. I mean, no one's perfect. It's yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. But I, I like PVE. So like, I like a more Jeopardy style and I like, I like a more learning CTF. That's, that's for me. Um, but how much thought do you give into how players are going to interact with each other when you're developing the challenges? Because I have to imagine that's one of the biggest, as an attack and defense, it's all about how teams interact with each other. How, like, what, how do you go through the process of designing some of those challenges? I know that's a big question, but is there anything in particular that, that you want to talk about? Yeah, it, it is super broad. Um, and I think it, the game design aspect is something that uh, CTF uh, organizers don't always consider. Um, and for the attack defend CTF, which there really aren't very many, not only is this the, the biggest and best one, but there, there really aren't too many alternatives. Most CTFs are kind of a jeopardy board of, of challenges and you just kind of pick one and do it. And it's like kind of like a speed run. You're just trying to do it as, as fast as you can, faster than other teams, that kind of thing. Um, so, for our uh, game, there's, like you said, a lot of interactions uh, between players. So we have to, for example, model scoring very carefully. Um, so, you know, we don't want uh, one team that's solving one challenge to, like, run away with the game because we make it too many points uh, versus another challenge. So we have to be very careful about how, ma how many points is a flag worth? Uh, how many flags can be redeemed? How does that look over time? Uh, so, so modeling all of those things are really important. Uh, and then also, just kind of trying to encourage things with points. Um, so we have a king of the hill challenge. Um, and one of the design considerations in that is we want people to try to win in the little king of the hill rounds. So uh, in an earlier iteration of that design, we said, well, a win is worth two points and a tie is worth one and a loss is worth zero. But then winning is not so much better than tying. So it might be better for you to just try and like tie with everybody uh, spend more of your time on other challenges, things like that. So we adjusted it so that a win was worth three points uh, to you know, give the winner a much bigger edge on things. Similarly, I mentioned this like concept of SLA where you have to keep your services up. The SLA penalty is much larger than um, the, amount, the amount of points you score on somebody to ensure that teams keep their services up because we want them to be attacking each other. And we want the main method of defense to be patching the service, like fixing the bug, 
rather than just taking the service down so that you don't lose any points by being scored on. Well, so this was this was actually huge because in prior years, the, the CGC year, for example, there was an after analysis of what was the most effective way <laughs> for your thing to, to game the game, if you will. And if, if I remember correctly, they came up with the, what was it, yours? That's my, that's my blog post. Yeah, yeah. If I remember correctly, it was like if you had just left your services up the whole time, you would have finished third, yeah. right? And so that's, that's fascinating, but you don't necessarily know the rules of the game while you're playing it, so it's really hard to game it and not just basically roll the dice. Um, in fact, uh, Alex has a story about how he won his black badge. <laughs> oh, is this the one where I was preparing, you're saying? No, no, no. Uh, yeah, the pairing one. Oh, yeah. It's so, because it's very similar in a different sense. Yeah, so in DEF CON 22, that was the year I won my black badge, is at the Darknet, there was tons of different points you could get for going all over con, building your badge, and things like that. And when I actually started looking at the math, I realized that pairing with badges was, it was weighted a lot. It was weighted a lot more than it, I felt it probably should. So I ended up sitting in the solder, well, it's the hardware hacking village because the soldering skills village didn't exist at the time. But just sitting there and helping people assemble their badges and meeting them, and I had to meet a ton of people, which was great. But then I would sit down and work on challenges. The moment someone assembled their badge, we're like, hey, let me go test your badge. And then beep, <laughs> sink it on up and test the badge. It was actually really funny because the badge was only capable of holding 50. And what ended up happening was I, I didn't realize that. So I got like 70 badges to realize I, we were starting to overwrite them. So it was, it was it was a lot of fun looking at the point engines. So the, but, but the that also almost feel that almost feels like a situation where it was working as intended. So uh, you know, you got to meet a lot of people. You got to help a lot of people with soldering. At tour camp a few weeks ago, there was a event called Bureaucracy, and I kind of realized early on it was like, oh, this is a way to get like people who are new at this camp, a fun game to play where they have to go around the camp, collect stamps from different groups of people, learn how to like pull style a phone by wrapping on the hook switch and get them to meet new people for, you know, a, one of those like awful, like soccer practice conical paper cups of, you know, Rainier Lager. <laughs> So I, the question I had, though, in, in this context is because this is, a, this is a common problem. Once you game the game and you figure out what's the most effective way for me to get the most points in the most rapid way, this, the, speed, uh, the speed run uh, issue, right? Do you guys do anything to combat that in the sense that one of the things Darknet did was we didn't publish what things were worth? And we didn't necessarily publish your scores until much later on, or we give you a, a time frame where you could see that. Have you done anything to combat the gaming the game, or is that just part of the game at this level? I, yeah, I think the, my philosophy on it is um, if there is a way to game the game that is not in the spirit of the game, then the game design is, is fundamentally broken and, and needs to be addressed. Um, and I, I know in past years, uh, like the CTF here has like hidden scores and, and things like that. Um, we're, you know, we're still toying with hiding some of the scores tomorrow to, you know, increase anticipation kind of thing. But I think my philosophy is there's no sport, there's no other competitive endeavor I can think of where, oh, we don't know who's winning in the fourth quarter because we turned the scores off or something, right? Like, you, you know what the score is. That's knowing the score does not lessen the anticipation of, you know, seeing teams perform and, and be scoring and, and like, you know, win the game. So uh, let me ask you a wrap up question unless you have Oh no, something. I was just gonna say, as I know just speaking personally, I know that was a frustrating aspect to me when the scores go down because then it just also encourages teams. I mean, more in Jeopardy style where it encourages teams to go, okay, we're gonna hold on to points. Where and that here it's a little harder, but I know that can add some frustration. I mean, I don't know, maybe in boxing they they don't show you who wins. When they <laughs> so, uh, so to wrap up, this will not go live until tomorrow morning. When is the, When does the next uh, round start? So the next round uh, starts at 10 a.m. We're going to run to uh, 2 p.m. Uh, and then we have to end. Live CTF might go a little bit longer, but we need to get our scores into the. Uh, you know, black badge thing, like tell people, yeah, to dark tangents so we can do all the pomp and circumstance of, uh, you know, awarding the winners and things like that. So do you have any surprises for the teams on the final day or is it going to be more of what they've been seeing already? I mean, it wouldn't be a surprise, would it? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the best answer they can give. I think that's a good point. Thank you so much. I am so excited to see some of the write-ups that come from this. Thank you for watching, and as always, hack on.